This is Bishop Michael Burbage, and you are listening to the Walk Humbly Podcast. Welcome to the Walk Humbly Podcast. I'm Billy Atwell, Chief Communications Officer for the Diocese and your co-host. If you're listening to this podcast, then you are benefiting from the generosity of those who have given to the Bishop's Lenten Appeal. So to those who have made this possible by you know funding the communications office and the, the different media ministries that we have here, thank you so much for what you've invested in. If you haven't already, please make sure you rate this podcast and write a review wherever you're listening to it. And if you're listening on YouTube, make sure you subscribe and ring the bell. You can sign up for our e-newsletter at arlingtondiocese.org. You can follow Bishop Burbage on Twitter, at Bishop Burbage, where every day you can read a short reflection of the gospel of that day. You can also follow the uh, diocese on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Send your questions for the podcast to info at arlingtondiocese.org. Again, that's info at arlingtondiocese.org. I welcome your host, Bishop Burbage. Bishop, how you been? I'm doing well, Billy. Thank you. I hope all of our listeners are doing well. I know these are still very challenging days and lots of uncertainty out there, but I want everyone to know I, I pr- I'm praying for you and ask you to stay safe and healthy and for God to watch over you. And hopefully maybe in this these, this summer, uh, our listeners have a chance to uh, be with family, maybe get that opportunity to be renewed and, and refreshed. But uh, thoughts and prayers are with everyone uh, during these very challenging times. Thank you. So, Bishop, today we're going to discuss uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, the tearing down of statues, you know, efforts to defund the police, and reopening of diocesan schools. But before we dig into that, earlier this week, the Supreme Court handed down two major decisions, uh, both of which sided with the position of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops and Religious Freedom in the teachings, which is a part of the teaching of our church. Can you talk us through some of the basics of, of what those two uh, decisions were and why that matters to us? Right, and how providential. We just recently, in June, celebrated Religious Freedom Week, right? Uh, often saying that religious liberty is the greatest freedom that we have a- as a nation, and so we're always staying vigilant uh, so that 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 great gift, that religious freedom, is not violated. And you're right; this past Wednesday was a critical and a positive day uh, for the church in the United States. Uh, one decision uh, of the Supreme Court, Billy, related to the uh, famous case that's been going on for a while, uh, the Little Sisters of the Poor, mm. and the basically they were being uh, forced to provide uh, contraceptive coverage in their health insurance plan as part of the Affordable Care Act. Right. Uh, this was uh, certainly uh, against uh, our religious convictions and, and our beliefs, and an infringement, uh, quite honestly. And the court voted seven two, uh, which is rare uh, in, in these times, uh, and. And, and made it clear that no religious institution or person should be forced uh, to violate the teachings and tenets of their faith. And, uh, and in addition, we should not buy into the fallacy uh, that contraception is health care. So mm-hmm. uh, the Little Sisters of the Poor, uh, we want to uh, thank them for their witness, uh, for their uh, perseverance, uh, and for their... Um, for their great example. Yeah, they really stepped out in courage and, they really and were did. the face of this important case, and they did such good work, and I'm sure they took a lot of heat for it. But And um, they're not used to that arena. No, uh, <laughs> that's true. It's a wonderful, wonderful religious uh, community that uh, is dedicated to taking care of the elderly, most especially the sick and the mm-hmm. dying. Uh, it's not something they looked forward to, being out in the public arena, but they knew what was at stake. That's a great example for all of us. And then the second case involved the right of Catholic schools, Mm. uh, free of government interference, to choose teachers uh, who will teach and model the Catholic faith. And by a vote of seven to two, Mm -hmm. uh, the court ruled in favor of of the schools. Uh, So there was an attempt, uh, we saw with this case, by some to separate uh, education, the education provided by our schools, uh, from our religious mission. And yeah, that just cannot be. We're one. The, the two are essentially uh, connected. Right. Uh, and education, as we know, so many of us believe, so many of us have benefited from the fact that uh, education is central to the Catholic Church's mission, and our schools uh, carry out a very specific, uh, fundamental ministerial role. So when people send their children to our schools, they uh, naturally expect the teachers. Uh, to model the faith and the school and 
the faith that the school was founded upon. Right, uh, right. And those values and principles define who we are. Right. So the Supreme Court, once again in this case, affirmed religious liberty, which is a founding principle uh, of our nation. So I want to thank uh, everyone, uh, especially during Religious Freedom Week, uh, who have been offering specific prayers and intentions for cases and situations like this, uh, the leadership of our United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, and so many others who uh, offered uh, their prayers. Yeah, this was a, this was a great week. Sometimes we get a you know, something handed down from the Supreme Court, and we're not very excited about what right. we get. This is one to celebrate. Certainly right. a good week for religious freedom. Yes, and you know, if if you're interested in being updated on these kinds of issues, what's happening with regard to religious freedom, both nationally but also within our state, make sure you go to vacatholic.org, sign up for the email list. Um, from the Virginia Catholic Conference. So that's the conference where the, the Bishop of, of Arlington and Richmond um, form as the head, and that is the public policy body for the church in our commonwealth. So please go to vacatholic.org and sign up so you can be updated when these things come down and understand the rationale behind our position. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that. It's a, I really do want to encourage our listeners. It's a tremendous resource, uh, resource and it's a great teaching tool. Yeah, very good. Uh, Bishop, one of the most uh, notable organizations in the news right now is Black Lives Matter. It began as a statement or kind of a, a sentiment, but it became an organization that has led to a lot of protests and demonstrations uh, throughout the nation. A lot of people are being asked, you know, what their position is on this um, organization and the sentiment. You know, what is yours when it comes to Black Lives Matter? Yeah, thank you, Billy. Um, as you alluded to, there are um, really two different things going on here. Mm -hmm. uh, there is the statement. Black, three words, black lives matter. Right. Well, that's really the gospel. Uh, we are all created in the image and likeness of God, every one of us without exception. And therefore there is an inherent dignity that must be respected and uphold as we revere all of human life. So mm -hmm. to say black lives matter, it's a, it's a, it's a statement reflective of, of the gospel of life, right. uh, which certainly says every life, every life matters uh, because of being created in God's image and likeness, his spirit dwelling within us. Uh, and so uh, to say that uh, and to use those three words and to remind people uh, every life and black lives matter, uh, it, it's a good thing to do. It's, mm -hmm. it's rooted actually um, in, in the gospel. It's a basic part of our, our teaching um, as, as, as Catholics. Uh, uh, and alternatively, uh, uh, there is um, there's also uh, an organization with the same name um, that uh, holds positions that we Catholics would oppose to, especially in the area of uh, sexuality and gender. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So I think we just have to know, you know, when we are saying Black Lives Matter, what, what are we focusing on? And what are we saying um, when we say that is to be supported? Every human person is to be revered and cherished and dignity is to be upheld. Of course, absolutely. That's who we are as children of God. Uh, but you know, it brings us really to the larger issue that is uh, very much in the, in the forefront of, of all of us as a nation right now, and, and that is racism. Right. And uh, this has been an issue that uh, the church and we here in the Diocese of Arlington uh, have taken very seriously, even just within the past year or two. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, last year, uh, participated in, in listening sessions uh, of how this, this evil of racism has specifically impacted the lives uh, in an unjust way of so many people, our brothers and sisters, our fellow parishioners mm -hmm. and our neighbors. And you know, to hear the stories of how uh, being a victim of, of racism, discrimination, uh, just really touched your heart. It's like, it made you sad that you know, uh, this, is, this is a reality, uh, not only in the past, but also uh, in the present. And we have to work uh, definitely to eradicate any form of, of racism in, in our in our world and in our society. I remember after the listening sessions, you came back and summarized on the podcast. You know some of the things that that you had heard, and it was so clear that as a pastor, you know your pastor's heart was was hurt by what some of the stories that people conveyed and the things that you heard in that listening session. Right. I remember that well. Yeah, absolutely, Billy. And the uh, bishops of, of the country have uh, I've, I've encouraged our uh, parishioners uh, many times to read the uh, letter against racism. Uh, entitled uh, by the bishops, Open Wide Our Hearts, The Enduring Call uh, to Love. Right. In fact, we were uh, 
we were supposed to have a, a conference on this very topic uh, in March, right before yeah, the here pandemic. Locally. Yeah, right. and it was it was going to be a, you know keynotes uh, speech, uh, mass, mm -hmm. a roundtable discussion, the ability uh, to have some questions and answers, and you know hopefully we can reschedule that uh, right. as we move forward. Uh, but you know what we have to understand: this is not just a political issue. This is this is who we are as, as followers of God uh, and, and of His Son Jesus. Uh, and we have to first understand that racism is an evil uh, that cannot yeah. be tolerated in any form, and, and no person should ever look upon another person, uh, someone of another skin color, and then see them as lesser. Uh, we have to acknowledge, Billy, I think, uh, tragically, that issues that exist within society sometimes occur within the church as well. Right. We, we, have, to, we have to acknowledge that. Sadly, it's painful, uh, but, but it, it's, it's the reality. Uh, we're not immune from the wider problems. So we must identify instances of racism and treat them as we would any other evil and, and try our best to, to work it out. Uh, and we must also actively work with our young people to ensure that they think properly about people who do not look like, like them, mm. uh, that they are compassionate towards those who uh, suffer discrimination or abuse, and that they are courageous witnesses of the gospel uh, when they see any form of injustice like that. So it, this is an issue that is ongoing. Uh, it's an issue we've addressed in the past. It's an issue we must continue to address today. In fact, I'm, it's providential that after this podcast today, I'm having a Zoom session uh, with leaders of our black community mm -hmm. uh, because I need to, to hear from them, um, not only about their experiences, but what it is now that they think we should be doing as a diocese. And these are our brothers and sisters. And I, I'm very much looking forward to this conversation and to the follow-up that will occur. You know, it's interesting. We get questions and emails from people. They're well-meaning. And they'll say, you know, what is the church doing on racism? Or when is the bishop going to speak out on it? And I'm always so happy to get that email because we can quickly respond to that with a litany of things that have not just happened recently, but of things that have happened, you know, over the years, um, you know, e even prior to you, um, being installed here in Arlington, you know the fact that we have an office of multicultural ministries, and the, and the purpose of that office to help uh, bring together, but to also work with, you know, uh, communities of um, a Asian ancestry or African ancestry, whatever it might be, to, but to bring them together. You know, there's a regular rosary conference call, praying for an end to racism, and that existed prior to this year, right. prior to the situations that we're dealing with now. And just how many times you've offered commentary and statements and spoken about it on the podcast for Black History Month, Catholic Black History Month. How many people don't know that there is Catholic Black History Month? Right. And there's such yeah. a rich heritage there. Um, but there's so many good things that we can point to that we can continue build, building. Yeah, upon. and you're right. As a diocese, uh, we should be very proud, um, you know, because it's been for years uh, that the uh, realization that we are blessed in this diocese to have so many cultures and people of different backgrounds and to celebrate and also to acknowledge that there are unique pastoral needs uh, to each given community. And so uh, this diocese for many, many years uh, has been in the forefront of doing that. And I'm very, very proud to continue that good work. That's wonderful. So on a related topic, there's been a move, a movement in our country to tear down statues of those who represented uh, the Confederacy or maybe those who have owned slaves and so on. And it's kind of devolved to a point that statues of Catholic saints have been desecrated. Um, also, we just heard about a, a Marian statue that, that was spray painted today. You know, it's, it was being circulated on social media. Um, you know, and there was a, a Black Lives Matter activist actually that suggested that the statue of Jesus should be torn down if the statue doesn't look African. Right. Um, very kind of troubling things here. What are your thoughts as, as we've seen this develop in the news? No, this is, it's very troubling uh, to me, uh, especially when we hear of statues of Catholic saints or Blessed Mother uh, uh, being torn down or vandalized. Yeah. And uh, so first, uh, you know, Billy, the way I think about it is, you know, we, we understand uh, that, you know, free, free speech and the ability to let your voice be heard is, is, is a great gift that we have uh, in, in this country. Uh, but it, it does not give you the right uh, to break the law right. and to be violent. Um, and, and, and that I don't think we can ever find uh, to be acceptable. No person uh, has a right to deface public or private property. Uh, we have peaceful, lawful ways to seek a remedy for something that, that you feel is unjust. And I've heard that process described that, you know, if there is a, a statue that's prominent within a community, 
uh, that is a source of opening wounds and, and making those wounds even deeper. And the best thing to do is not to have that statue there. Well, then there's a process to go about that, uh, mm -hmm. to let your voice be heard, uh, to bring it to those you've elected to represent you, to allow a vote to take place. And if it needs to be taken down, it should be taken down. And if it needs to be moved to a museum so we don't lose the, the, the you know, that sense of history of, you know, what yeah. we've learned the from context, the past, right. yeah, or the context of that, then, then let that be. But mm. uh, I, I don't think I, I would ever uh, give uh, a nod to the fact that, you know, uh, if you don't like this, then, you know, in a vandalize it or, right, right. or you know, uh, break the law and, and take it into your own hands. I, I don't think that's helpful. Um, so, and, it, you know, and, and another concern is like, where does it, where does that end? You know, yeah. uh, it, it, you know, we're imperfect uh, as a as a people, as a as a nation. We are. We, we're, we're, and yet there's much to celebrate. And uh, I think we have to be very, very careful here. Um, but I would uh, really urge that, you know, if it, it, there are certain things that you uh, need to protest, then do so peacefully um, and, and allow your voice to be heard. But. Do not add to the violence uh, that so sadly we're witnessing across our country right now. And we're so blessed to live in a nation where the right to peaceful protest right. is enshrined in the Constitution. Yes. Of, of all the most basic things you have a right to, right. how many nations in, in history have had that as a basic right? Um, you know, another, you know, it's a, it's a fairly radical idea that's been pro, uh, proposed and even considered by some city councils is to defund the police. So they'll see, you know, unjust actions like the, the murder of George Floyd. And they say, you know, the, kind of the reaction to that by some has been to defund police. What's your reaction to that proposition? First, let me, um, yeah, respond, Billy, by uh, making it clear yet again, because we, we have said this uh, previously, that as a nation, we should have zero tolerance for abusive behavior by police officers. Correct, right. So we, we, we agree on that. And uh, they have a very difficult job, absolutely. Uh, but the men and women who wear the uniform uh, should be the individuals who can withstand the pressure and not resort to abuse or unjust violence against any individual. And That's so when we, so true. tragically, when we saw that scene of Mr. Floyd, it, you know, our hearts were just just broken to, to see see the abuse of power like that. And uh, there is zero tolerance, mm -hmm. and we have to make that clear across the board. Uh, but I do think at the same time, uh, we have to be careful uh, to uh, make sure that uh, we don't use instances of abuse by police as uh, justification for condemning all police, you know, True. or, you know, what do we mean by defunding them? Uh, police provide invaluable service they, uh, to maintain law and order, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's a good. And I don't think uh, any country can survive without police to protect law-abiding citizens from criminals who uh, victimize others for personal gain. Mm. Now, reviewing the budgets of, of w how that money is utilized, how is it directed, that review, I would think, should take place every year, like it should in, in a diocese, right. as it should in an organization. <laughs> are, we, are we using the funds given to us to be at our very best? Mm. You know, And maybe some of the funds have to be reallocated for maybe better training. Uh, maybe for uh, other ways in which uh, the police could be of, of greater service to the community or, or whatever. So reviewing the budget, reallocating funds and things like that, but to defund uh, those who we entrust uh, to uh, keep law and order, um, you know, I, I think is, a, a, is not a, a great path to travel. Um, so I think that should be very considered very seriously. And, you know, I, I also often you know, wonder what happens, you know, that w when we see, uh, you know, someone uh, abuse power so tragically like we did with Mr. Floyd, um, that the next step is to generalize, you know, all police officers. Uh, and I think that's very, very uh, unfair, you know, that, uh, you know, we, we, whether it's a, you know, a, a bad teacher or a bad uh, someone in the medical profession who uh, abused power or a priest or whatever, if the next step is to put everyone who shares that same profession, that same category, 
and in that negative light, whereas the great majority each and every day are doing the vo living out the vocation and the work entrusted to them. I, I don't think that's a, a good thing to do either. Right. And, uh, you know, I, and, and we see that happening now. And we see that, um, you know, the, the, the abuse uh, uh, that, uh, that, that we talked about, the abuse of, of, of police uh, uh, using their, their uh, office in, in a way that's not honorable cannot be tolerated. But these, these uh, men and women who uh, carry out uh, their responsibility with honor uh, should not be lumped into that same category. Right. And, right. Uh, and that's true with any profession. Yeah. Right. And I mean, we, you know, we certainly, we saw it with priests mm -hmm. uh, when we went through, you know, and I, I experienced that personally. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, yes, if, if, if a, if, if a priest, if a police officer or teacher is, is bringing dishonor uh, to our profession or vocation, uh, we have to speak out against that. And in a sense, we own that because right. we're colleagues. And even though I, I haven't acted in such a way, whatever. I have to, I have to say, well, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm really sorry that one of my colleagues, or you know, did that. And I think we owe that as as an apology. But let me assure you that that there is no room for that. Right. Um, and and I think that's what we have to do uh, with the police now too. We have yeah. to uh, make sure that you know those who are doing their job every day and, and putting their lives in service of us uh, should be given um, that respect. I've noticed there's a, there's obviously been a change in, in the uh, policing practices over time. And one thing that's changed is the intimate connection of a police officer to the community. You right. know, they used to be kind of regionalized differently. Now it seems that, you know, a police officer doesn't necessarily know the community that he's in. It's no fault of his own. It's just right. the nature of how he's assigned responsibilities. It seems like maybe if there was more of that, that connection, right. some of this might be dissuaded a bit because they'll right. know the context of where they're going right. sometimes. And yeah, and don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, it's like in, in any profession, you know, there needs to be accountability. There needs Correct. to be an honest review and where things are wrong and there's behavior, we, we have to address that. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we can have little patience uh, where what you're called to do is, 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 is not being done. Right. And, and so we know that, you know, throughout, the, throughout our country, there are, you know, grave concerns and we should look at them. We should acknowledge right. them. So I'm not downplaying that at right. all. Right. And uh, uh, I just wanted to be sure uh, that, that I say that. Uh, I think in, in a, in, for me, in a personal way, uh, it, it brings back a lot of memories because uh, my mother's father uh, was a police officer. And um, I, I know my, you know, my mom telling the stories that, you know, every night that uh, he would leave the house, uh, that she would be praying that, that he came back that night. And any time the phone rang um, from the time he was, you know, on his beat, uh, it was always a, a, a moment of panic. Uh, and yet she was so proud of him. He served the community well. Uh, he was so respected by the members of his community. And, um, you know, we, we want to honor uh, those, those who are doing that, and we want to have zero tolerance for those who are not. Yeah, that's yeah. very true, very yeah. true. Um, one question that many people in our diocese have, and I'm sure you've he heard it already, is what's the next school year going to look like? Um, I, you know, again, I'm sure you get that question a lot, but you know, as we look to this 2020 school year, what are some of the things people should expect and, and see? Yeah, uh, you are right. This is the question of the day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your parents are asking it, uh, uh, and, and rightfully so. Uh, and, you know, Billy, you know, things, there's so still so much uncertainty out there, mm -hmm. you know, and what, what things are like right now uh, on this July day. Um, I don't know if it's going to be the same in this time next month. We don't know. Right. Maybe things will be much better. Maybe, God forbid, things will be a little bit mm -hmm. more uh, unsettling. We don't know. But here's what we're planning. Uh, first of all, uh, the health and well-being and safety of our students uh, and of our, our educators mm -hmm. uh, is the priority. Right. All right? So that, that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, we, we follow the science. Uh, and we allow the experts who, uh, you know, guide this, this situation 
uh, to provide guidelines that we ver- very much will ad- adhere to uh, for the safety of, of all those involved. But we are very uh, much uh, determined uh, to open our schools in the fall. Uh, we would like to do so uh, five days a week. Um, it's, it's funny, some parents say that. Now, uh, Bishop, if you open the school, make sure it's five days yeah, a week. Right. Right uh, <laughs> but, We're all running a little ragged. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true. Uh, but uh, I think that um, because the parents know and, and even the medical experts know that the emotional and mental health of children uh, is, is also at stake. And they need to be uh, in, in a community with their mm-hmm. friends and learning and in a learning environment. But we can only do so, Billy, we will only do so if uh, we can, to the best of our ability, assure the health and well being uh, of our students and, and our Catholic educators. And so we have to allow for some flexibility. Mm-hmm. There are certain um, guidelines that, that will need to be in place. Um, but each school's different. You know, right. the size of each school is different, the classrooms, the space, and all those things. So uh, we will allow our, our schools and, and you know, our, our pastors and our principals and all uh, to figure out a way of what they can do mm-hmm. or what they can't do. Right. And there may be schools who, well, to adhere to these guidelines, uh, whatever, we're just not in a position to do that, so we may have to adjust. What an elementary school can do may not be what a high school can do. Right. And uh, so, so, yes, there will be certain principles and guidelines, but also the flexibility based on uh, the community or the school itself. And that's kind of the managed model of the church. We always call that you know, subsidiarity, yeah. right? That yeah. decisions are best left to the lowest level right. that are appropriate. So right. some decisions have to be made by, by you and Dr. Joe Vorbach, the superintendent, kind of setting right. basic principles, but then working with the institutions at the local level to... To accommodate whatever their restrictions or opportunities right. might be, and I've you know I've talked to a few of the principals, and they are working dearly to open as much as they can, but right. they're trying to be prudent as well. Yeah, and there's lots of collaboration going on. Yeah, you know, there's collaboration with the educators, with the parents. You know, um, so on a local level, there's communications going on, mm-hmm. um, and to see see where we are, and uh, but we're going to, have to be flexible. Uh, mm-hmm. We've seen that throughout this situation, and uh, but I will also take another moment to commend and thank our, our Catholic educators for Absolutely. you know since March where everything had to close down, how quickly uh, they were on uh, able to provide education, yeah. uh, really and, and really not compromise what was being given to the students. And thanks to the parents too. Uh, I really do want to thank the parents. I'm looking at you because you, <laughs> you and your wife also uh, were you know, having that responsibility of continuing the education of, of your children. Parents, I know with your own uh, responsibilities of work and employment, plus this additional responsibility, you've been heroic. And uh, I wanna just give a great uh, shout out, a great thank you to all our parents out there. Wonderful. So we've gone through a lot in this podcast, but there was one question that came from a person I thought would be very timely, you know, for where we are in this pandemic and so on. So I'd like to ask this. If, if we have gone through a lot. In this we have. Yeah. <laughs> this is a heavy one, but uh, yeah. so Joshua, he's actually visiting from, um, from out of state, he's from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, he said, even without something like COVID going on in my home diocese had issued a dispensation from the obligation to attend Sunday mass or issued any other edict or dispensation, but I traveled to another diocese without such a dispensation, which one am I beholden to? So if there's a Arlington parishioner that goes to another state, let's say they don't have the dispensation, right. is it your dispensation or the lack of dispensation in that other diocese that they're it's my dispensation. Oh, okay, yeah, good. So, so <laughs> in the case that uh, uh, Joshua mentioned, uh, my dis- uh, dispensation applies uh, mm-hmm. to you, Joshua, wherever you are, because you're a member of this diocese. Right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's okay. Good, that's a good question, though. Yeah, because yeah. it's like, yeah. does it transfer yeah. you know, across <laughs> <laughs> diocesan lines? Yeah. So that's good to know. Yeah. So. All right, Bishop, any final thoughts? Again, we've gone through some heavy things here, but any just kind of final summary thoughts, and if you would send us off with your Yeah, you know, Billy, you're right. We've These are... These are very heavy um, issues and subjects we've discussed today. And, uh, and these are unsettling days as we continue uh, to see uh, evil and violence and division uh, within our diocese. It, it does. It, it can easily give us all a heavy heart. Uh, but we're people of faith, and, and we can never forget that. Uh, we have the truth. Um, we know the way. Um, and God is with us. 
And uh, I think all that we can do uh, is to renew our efforts and promises every day uh, to be faithful to what God is asking of us and to entrust our nation, to entrust those we love, to tr entrust those who are suffering and those who are victims to the Lord. He is very near to us uh, and we need his healing love and strength and grace more than ever. So uh, I encourage all of our listeners uh, in the midst of everything that we're experiencing right now uh, to please continue to uh, be men and women of faith, uh, men and women of prayer, uh, and men and women who, through your own lives, offer that good example that our nation and, and our world both need now more than ever. And uh, so, uh, again, as I said in the beginning of the podcast, and just to repeat, uh, please know, everyone, that uh, my thoughts and prayers are with you. May God watch over you, keep you safe and healthy, and together, let's keep praying for one another and walk humbly with our God. Thank you for listening to the Walk Humbly podcast. Make sure you check out more episodes on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. You can follow me on Twitter at Bishop Burbage, where I offer gospel reflections each morning and share photos and updates of what is going on in the Diocese of Arlington. Stay up to date with news, event information, and inspirational content by subscribing to our e-newsletter at arlingtondiocese.org.